Hey guys, welcome to DEF CON 864. This is the December meeting, the last one of 2023. Let's go. Yeah, we've had an amazing year so far, and it's, it's going to end with an amazing talk tonight from uh, Cal, uh, taking us through some muddy waters, some muddy lessons here tonight. But uh, real quick, if, the, if you're new to DEF CON 864, we are not a black hat, illegal hacking group that is out to take all your family's money or anything like that. We are, for, in most cases, all of us are security professionals. That's what we do in our day job. This is really more of a hands-on, dig deep into some topics of technology, digital privacy as they intersect life around us. Uh, we are very much in favor of all of society becoming better through technology and our use of it. So if you have any uh, questions or qualms about some of the terms or the phrases that we use here, like hackers or stuff, stuff like that, let us know. In our vernacular, hacker is not the same thing as threat actor. Those are two very different things. So uh, let's keep that clear. I had a great opportunity to share that distinction during a big all hands meeting this week. So <laughs> uh, conference season is over, so nothing new to share about that. And uh, I think we're gonna do a little bit of a shake up into the new year around our speaker schedule. If you would like to share and have a topic, we open and welcome all people to come and share something that they're interested in. So don't hesitate to reach out to anybody that's a lead on uh, Discord to, uh, to get on that schedule. And we do post our schedule as far in advance as possible on our website under the resources tab. Uh, right now there's nothing for, December, or for the new year for 2024. That's gonna change in the next couple weeks. Uh, but a lot of it's going to be TBDs all the way down for the month, so we'll start filling that in as we go. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to my cohort in crime, my other co-founder, Cal, who has always intrigued us by his projects around MUDs and his development process, but I'm really intrigued to hear how he's used that throughout his career coming up. So without any further ado, Cal. Thank you, Overcast. So muddy lessons. Uh, before I go into the agenda, there's some pretty cool artwork throughout this, all generated by AI. Uh, if anyone's interested in some of the prompts, I've embedded them into the presentation on the notes of the, each picture. So when I post the slides, if anyone's like, how did you make that picture? The prompts and everything are gonna be used, and I use Dolly from ChatGPT as the, the engine. So for the agenda, I'm gonna step us a little bit through a very brief uh, mud history, so it's a little bit of mud history, just for folks you might be familiar with the term mud, multi-user dungeon, multi-user dimension, but I don't want to make any assumptions, so we're going to step through that a little bit to give some context and framing of what this thing has been, <coughs> and it, this was an interesting talk for me to put together because it's kind of a step through a lot of my life because, as we'll find out, I've been playing this game or working on this game or somehow you know, working with MUDs for over 20 years, which is quite a long time to do. Uh, and so along the way, I've learned some things. And so I'm just gonna kind of share what my hobby in MUDs has led me to and through. And more, in, more lately is gonna be the part two. So since 2020, I've been doing some C programming and doing code development for the MUD, which is a lot different to learn a new language, you know, more recent for me in the past several years. So I wanted to go through what that's been like and then end with some takeaways which are just gonna be you know, whatever I can think of at the moment based on the talk. So what is a MUD? A MUD is a multi-user dungeon, I kind of clarified that, but it adds together elements of role-playing games, uh, predominantly at least in the early era was hack and slash themed. And what I mean by that is you will have like a Dungeons and Dragons type of uh, environment where there's swords and there's shields and there's dragons and there's bears or owl bears or all types of different monsters where you're the, the, the hero and you're there to do combat with them. And so hack and slash means it's very combat oriented. Uh, a lot of the MUDs of the early days would also have some strong themes of player versus player. So there was some specific MUDs that were focused purely on player versus player. So the whole context of the game wasn't so much to kill NPCs or non-player characters, but really to power yourself up or to test your skills against someone else in a text versus text-based battle. You know, these are all text-based. Uh, what we see on the right-hand screen there is actually the current logon banner uh, for black mud uh, going into our next wipe, which will be in April of next year, but the age of discovery. So that's what it looks like when you connect to a mud, an example of showing some ASCII art, you know, because that's part of our flair. 
but MUDs run on over the Telnet protocol. Almost all of them are free to play. And back in the day, I'm going to show a little bit of the history line, but think of it this way. In the early day, the heyday of MUDs in the 90s, there was probably uh, several thousand, at least between 1,000 to say 3,000 at least MUDs online. Uh, Jazz, did you have a question? I'm sorry, did you say Telnet? Telnet, yeah. Okay. Yep. Still? Still today. Now, some MUDs do offer playing their game over WebSockets, and some will offer it over SSH, but predominantly, uh, those true to their roots still offer their game available over Telnet. Black MUD today is still a pure Telnet game. Uh, so we do have part of our roadmap, not that this is a roadmap talk, but we will be looking at incorporating it in SSH, probably doing a web client uh, down in the future. But yeah, that's, that's where their roots are. Uh, a lot of these started off in university networks, some even in the mainframe days, so Telnet was one of those protocols that kind of came out of that era. From a historical reference point, a lot of folks from the, the older generations that are in tech are familiar with the game Zork. So Zork is a single player version of MUD. It actually, uh, someone took Zork, they converted it into a different language and it had a different name, maybe Adventure. I could be misremembering that, but it was that recoded version of the game that was the inspiration for the first MUD or MUD 1 multi-user dungeon that was released in 1978. Uh, and MUDs are commonly referenced as the origins for quite a few of the massive multiplayer online games. So no one di directly says World of Warcraft or some of the more, I don't even know, modern MMOs uh, that shows my age. But uh, a lot of them did take inspiration from things like EverQuest, Ultima Online, Dark Age of Camelot, kind of the, the generation one of massive multiplayer online games. And those games were heavily based on MUDs. Uh, there's a, even, you know, EverQuest has a, a, a formal statement from back in the 90s where they clarified that they don't have any MUD code running inside EverQuest. And that was the thing that came about because there were some accusations type things. That they made remarks that they used MUDs as inspirations and people kind of ran with it. So here's, this is all from Wikipedia here, uh, but I just wanted to show a family of MUDs. So up here in the upper left is MUD1 and something called MIST. I'm not too familiar with MIST, but those were basically the two, the inspiration for a MUD called Abermud. And this is the Abermud family tree. This is the Daiku Mud family tree, and then here LP Mud, Tiny Mud, and there's other families as well. But these are kind of the mainstays that kind of spread out. And so Black Mud is of the Daiku family tree. So there's Abermud, 1987. Daiku Mud came out in 1990. I couldn't trace the release date of Silly Mud, but Silly Mud is the code base origin that we cloned off of to create Black Mud. And we came out in 1993, so this year is our 30th year anniversary uh, of being online. So let's take this back to, to me as, I guess, a kid, nine years old, nine to 12. Uh, this was probably my first inspiration that led me to even consider something like a MUD. Uh, so we had an IBM 8088. I was not allowed to touch it. Uh, that was like the rule. Uh, my dad was a police officer, so that was a thing. I think my mom got police quests for my dad to play uh, to see if he would enjoy it. And so whenever they weren't home, you know, I would always <coughs> like watch that thing and I'd learn how to turn it on. I figured out how to boot this thing up. And this game, just to give you some ideas, this was a, from Sierra Interactive. Mm -hmm. uh, they made a, quite a few games like this where it was very graphical in design. You can see the police officer here and you would walk up to the door, but there was nothing you could do, like you couldn't click on the door. You see there's a little text prompt down here, so you would say, open door. You would type, open door, and the game would probably spit back at you, it's locked. And you're like, God dang it. So then you would have to be like, unlock door. It would tell you, you don't have the keys. You know, so it kind of takes that type of, you give in a command, and it would give you back a return, and that's how you would have to do it. I spent. I can't even tell you, it felt like years. It was probably like weeks. Just trying to get out of that police station and get in the car so you could hit the road. It was a Looks lot like to do. They're all propped in the same, they're in that warehouse building. <laughs> Let's begin. Right there. How can they yeah. It's an impound. It's an impound, yeah. You eventually can get into this car right here and, and drive off. You know, it takes a lot to do. 
Uh, you have to like go into the locker, you have to take a shower, you have to go to the police brief, uh, you have to then suit back up, you have to make sure you get your gun and the keys, and then you can go out, unlock the car and drive away. And then driving was its own nightmare. Uh, it's funny, I still remember all of this pretty vividly, so it left an impression. Uh, but that was the main, I think the other games we had were like John Madden, which I didn't really care about that one too much. Um, so this is me here, uh, age 14 at that photograph. I was in the ninth grade. And the, my world at this time, you know, American Online was probably the, what I was using for the internet uh, that I socially engineered off of my neighbor because we didn't actually have the internet. I just helped her out one day. Oh, let me log you in. Uh, so that got me the internet. And I was uh, a fan of the internet relay chat, IRC. And I somehow got into the wear scene. I'm not sure how I got into the wear scene. Uh, the kid there actually pronounced it Juarez. I thought every, all of the pirate software came from Mexico for some reason, <laughs> crime cartels. I, I couldn't quite figure it out, but I, I legit would pronounce it Juarez. Um, and some, just some tools that I remember from my youth was like uh, WinNuke, uh, so this is what this would look like. So you could have the IP address of your buddy and you could nuke attack them to kick them offline. You could do a ping of death attack. Uh, but my favorite was back orifice from Call to the Dead Cow. Uh, man, this tool, you could really rock someone's computer's world. Beautiful uh, UX, too. Beautiful UX. Uh, <laughs> Wait, that was a UX. <laughs> <laughs> Operating system at this time, Windows 95. Um, I remember a buddy of mine, I would, Adam, I would play like the Windows startup song like a hundred times and repeat, or just tell his CD drive to be in a permanent state of open, so even if he would close it, it would pop back open. <laughs> yeah. Just little pranks. Change, um, change the, uh, the keyboard layout to Dvorak. That's right. <laughs> uh, but at the same time, you know, this kid here, I managed to find a group of friends and we played Dungeons and Dragons. And we only played Dungeons and Dragons like once a week that wasn't nearly enough for me. I wanted to play D&D, &D. like I wanted, like people love coffee, like I hear the expression, like give me a vein, like hook me up with an IV of coffee. Like I wanted Dungeons and Dragons hooked up into my arm so I was just living in that world. And that led me onto the internet using kind of the skills that I had at that time of IRC, the weird scene and everything else. I somehow stumbled across bulletin board system styles of play, which was I would post a message and I would wait for someone to respond to me and we would play that way way too slow. Again, I wanted the coffee, like the direct line of Dungeons and Dragons into my veins. And so I discovered mud somewhere in the, in the path. And that was pretty amazing for me because that meant interactive, I could stumble, and I was a total noob. Like, uh, yeah, it's a whole world where you don't know how to play. You're just reading text, so it forces you to get better at reading. I didn't have a reading hobby. Uh, and I also didn't have a really typing hobby either. So I wasn't a big typist and I wasn't a big reader. But this forces both of those things. So uh, I know it was somewhere around 1998 that I discovered Black Mud. Uh, and it was my favorite because it had that Dungeons and Dragons like content. You could play a monk or a druid or a cleric or a warrior. Um, and it was literally based on Dungeons and Dra Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, which is what I was playing. It still is mostly based on advanced Dungeons and Dragons as a rule set. I'm working on changing that. Um, then the other one that I got into uh, throughout my time just playing MUDs was one called God Wars. This one was one of those player versus player themed games. So it was hack and slash, player versus player. There was a ton of God Wars servers because generally like if you didn't like the way someone was running their mud, what would you do? You would go and just spin up your own mud. At least that's what it seemed like. And so there was a lot of different variants of these, but the big thing with these is they mashed together stuff from like monks, mages, angels, werewolves, or even Jedis and Super Saiyans. So you could literally be a Super Saiyan from Dragon Ball Z laying smack down to a werewolf from like the White Wolf universe. So that was pretty fun. Um, that was a big draw for me playing those. So if we look at just black mud, you know, that's the mud that I'm generally talking about. This is my timeline in the black mud universe. From like 98 to 2003, I was purely a player. Uh, towards the later parts of being a player, I was doing a little bit of, I was pretty good at finding bugs. Um, I don't know why. It, I, my general, I remember my mindset was, 
um, if I could find the bug, I could exploit the bug, but my exploiting the bug was to try to figure out exactly the conditions in which, of how it worked. I was testing. I wasn't exploiting. Because once I figured everything out and I was appropriately taken care of by exploiting it, I would hand it over to some of the admins to say, hey, I found this bug. You might want to work on this and fix it. Or can I help you? Uh, do you have any other bugs you want me to take a look and try to figure out? So I did that quite a bit. Um, and then around 2003, I moved over to, in the, the MUD universe, uh, the admins are generally deities inside the game. So we use the term immortal. So you're an immortal inside the game. Not all immortals are worshipable in the game, but many of them become worshipable in the game, which is just a, a fun MUD thing that players become deities. It's weird. Um, and as an admin, so you can see from 2003 all the way up to 2019, that's a pretty long stint of time where I was mostly just assisting with player problems. If the mud crashed and burned, then uh, I would reach out to someone that could actually bring it back online. Like I didn't have backend server access, I didn't have code access. Uh, I would have access to world content files, so objects, uh, enemies in the game, things like that. So I would do some work there either creating content or cleaning up content, but I also wasn't really a professional builder. We have people that that's what they do, that's what they enjoy doing. I have that creative edge in me sometimes, but really working with those files and the data schema stuff is so obscure, obtuse, and ugly, I just don't want to do it, so I generally don't. Uh, plus, as uh, one of the other main uh, admins would say, Grogar, in my English, it's just not so great sometimes, you know? So there's always typos in my work. Which leads me into coding. Perfect for someone who has a lot of typos, which I still do today, which just means C is very good at telling you you have a typo, which is perfect for me. So let's get into some muddy lessons. You know, so from 98 to 2001, guess what? I learned how to type because typing was how you survived. Uh, we actually played a game in the random channel of the Discord server not long ago, and we were the words per minute. And I ended up, you know, I, I generally avoid competing because I'm competitive. Uh, but then once we started playing, I started competing with myself just because of the little, what was it, the top two in the upper right hand corner. I got top 3%. I was like, I wonder what it takes to get top two. So I just kept doing it until I got top two. And then I finally called it quits there. But that was what I was able to crank out with random words. I attribute my typing all the way back to months, still to this day. Because uh, one of the, the ways to survive in that game it's not even a mechanic today anymore, but you would have scrolls of recall. And to, re to use a scroll, you would recite it. So I can type rec recall really freaking quickly because if you were about to die, like a player was smashing your face and you wanted to get out of dodge, rec recall. That's how you would live. Or you would probably rec recall them. Like, let me get you out of my face and then let me go run and hide. Um, the next is command fuzzing. Now, command fuzzing is actually something that you kind of get into on anything that you're using a command line on. And I got an example here, uh, but you could be on a Cisco switch, you could be on uh, an ASA, a Cisco firewall, Linux, even Windows command line. And by fuzzing, I mostly mean just figuring out that skill set of what commands work with what and what it is, what is it that they do. So here we're uh, looking at, uh, this is, I type look in a room, so I'm in the market square, there's some directions, there's some objects, and there's a guy in this room. So I'm picking on this fountain. There's an enormous fountain in the shape of a dragon that pours forth cool water. So I'm like, all right, well, I wanna try to chug that fountain, because I'm just that thirsty, I'm gonna chug it. And the game spits back and says, pardon? So that clearly didn't really do what I wanted it to do. I'm like, all right, well, maybe I can swim in the fountain. I get a response back, but it's not quite in the area I was looking for. It says, okay, you're now prepared to swim. So the swim part of my input there probably worked, and the fountain was just rejected because it probably isn't a part of the swim command. So this is where that fuzzing mindset comes in, that a mud is just naturally going to start teaching you. I did two things here, read fountain and look fountain. I'll have to, to talk to, to Fate about that because we should probably have those give some type of return back to the player if there's no actual interaction. So I would classify those two right here. I did highlight as a little bit of a bug. We could make that a little bit better. But then I did exam fountain for examine, and I get to see that it's full of clear liquid. And then I type drink fountain, and I drink that cool water. So 
just by nature of playing a MUD, you will develop this skill set of command fuzzing, which I started in back in 98. To kind of breeze through this, because I don't want to go too, super slow, but I want to give you some ideas and mindset here. So back in there, I learned the fundamentals of scripting. I'm going to touch a little bit on MUD clients, because they're a part of the whole ecosystem. Uh, but I learned the fundamentals of scripting. And I learned my first scripting language is called Zscript, which is a specific scripting language for a MUD client. So it's basically useful nowhere else. But it's a good place to start learning because I was able to kind of take care of some fundamental things about my character. And during this time, I learned about the Telnet protocol, just through exposure. And then just by chance, there was a player on the MUD uh, by the name, uh, he went by Panther or Decker. So Panther was his druid, Decker was his ranger. For some reason, he gave me a, access to a Mandrake Linux uh, shell out on the internet. I can't remember why, but I remember I specifically would use it to do like, things like ping a death and things like that to kick people offline. And I never did that to people on the MUD, but I would do that to people on IRC, um, definitely. So I think I just got access to that from talking to him. But it, the funny thing is I didn't know it was Linux at the time. It wasn't until after the fact that I eventually learned what that was and kind of clicked those dots. I just knew I could remotely log into something and do things from there and affect people elsewhere. And it wasn't coming from me. It's probably coming from his computer at the bank. Mm -hmm. Probably. <laughs> 2002, 2012. Advanced scripting, so I was just doing fancier stuff. I'll show some examples of some scripting that I did, but a lot of troubleshooting, but I gained exposure to data schemas. That was pretty big because, again, we're, I would do some stuff with the world, just put in my head the concept of, you know, I wasn't ever working with XML. I wasn't ever working with, I don't think JSON was an idea. I don't even know when that came out. Maybe it was existing in 2002. But learning and reading these old schema values, I learned what bit vectors were, I learned what you know, different types of formatting was, and that this had a purpose. Even though each one was unique and it sucked, I learned at basically what it was and how to understand it. And then through nature of the scripting, because those engines would use regex for parsing out text. So I, I started on my path of regex that I've used in my professional career to endless degrees. I worked for a sim vendor. Parsing logs, how do you parse logs? Regex. Um, so I started on that regex skill pretty early on. 2013, 2020, I, I call it self-claimed expert scripting because pretty much by this point, I would, in my career, you know, so in this time span, like around 2004 is when I started my professional career for the DOD. I kind of wanted to set up a career overlap, but I didn't do it. But 2004, I started my professional career and I would do a little bit of scripting there, but I would revisit the MUD specifically to retest my scripting capabilities. I would have ideas from back when I would play. I'm like, I wonder if I can automate that in the game. I wonder if I could like, map the entire world. I wonder if I could make it so my character never needs to know actually what he's wearing in any equipment slot, and I can just change my gear you know, because I want to. You know, and it would figure stuff out for me automatically. So that was in that 2013 and 2020 that I started doing those crazy ideas I had and making them a reality, which was fun. But it kind of gets boring because you eventually can only do so much. And that's where I was thankful that uh, the, the founder of the game came back during the COVID time and we had this whole revitalize of access and capabilities. And since then, I've been more on the side of programming for the game, so actually coding and learning the C language. Uh, ETL, extract, translate, and load. So that's taking that whole data schema knowledge and making and accelerating it and putting it to a purpose because I'm converting those old horrible data schemas into database tables. So extracting that old junky data, translating it into something that's actually useful, putting that into a database so it can actually be used. And of course, working with other team members you know, using agile development methodology, release management, albeit we do postpone quite a bit, so we need to work on that a little bit. Um, and even some of the like video production stuff, you know, I think it, this year we did that first the Q3 dev dialogue, which was fun to do. Really happy how that turned out. So a hodgepodge of, of skill sets really that I'm, I'm really showcasing here is a hobby can lead you down many paths, and you can learn so many things just by having a passion and an interest in something that 
you're passionate about. And these are some of mine. So on the client front, you know, this is going a back of memory lane. Now this is ZMUD 7.11. This is the end of its lifetime. This is how great it looked at the end of its lifetime. So this thing is a pretty basic uh, piece of tech. Uh, it is end of life as of 9, 2005. And yes, it is still in use by players today. Players will hold on to their MUD clients like till the end of their days because they, they code stuff in it and they never want to let it go. Uh, but this is what that looks like representation. So this is kind of what I was working in back in my early days of mudding. And I would do stuff like this. This one wasn't one of mine, but I would do exactly that type. So that's what mine would look like. And then CMUD came out a little bit later. So ZMUD became CMUD. This one went end of life 2011, still unused by players today. This is a screenshot actually of mine uh, from when I played on Black Mud. So a lot of the stuff I would do, the map there, all that would be from my use of this, this client. A lot of my stuff would be like command, I would just add my own commands into the prompt. So I don't need anything visual, I would just add my own elements. Like Forager. So this is an example of one of the ones that I would make, and there's way too much code to show, but this is just an example of the Z script on the left and the output of the Forager command, which the Forager uh, was really all about inside the game, you could forage for food. And so you can see I type in INV for inventory and I have a small wrinkled smooth strawberry and I have a bumpy fruit. And with forager enabled, instead of seeing that, when I type inventory, I see a sense life, sleep, feeble mind strawberry. That's color encoded where blue is a positive effect and red is a negative effect because eating that piece of fruit is gonna apply those spells to my character and I might not want to eat something that's gonna put me to sleep and make me stupid. Offer for the sense of being able to see something or sense something that's living. So here is just an example of how much stuff had to be created to help support this. So you had to do quite a bit of stuff to get things to work in these clients because you had to like capture the string and do logic and it was all in Z script. So it's whatever you had to do and how you had to do it in that language which wasn't a bad language, but it wasn't a great one either. Uh, there you go, I forgot I did that. But I also call out here, there's a small difference here if you notice, the, this is your prompts, so that's your hit points, and that's your movement. So in the game, like that's how much hits I can take, that's my movement. And I would have a stats here where I would also augment that part of my experience. So I would just enrich it with more details. I think the original, the color's like green if you're healthy yellow if you're not healthy all the way down to when you're almost dead then it would turn red and then you're basically dead um, so I put like a color gradient to it so it would actually progressively go to red so you're getting a little bit more in the know when you're about to die um, those are important this was a, a fun one I did I say fun as a as an immortal as a deity so this was code I wrote where I would, as an immortal, you can go to any room in the game. Like you don't need to move and traverse the world like a normal person does, you can teleport. So I kind of, in a way, hacked into the APIs that were in the client for manipulating the mapper in the game. And basically instead of, it was designed to map the game as you explored. It wasn't created to allow you to map the world while you're teleporting around the world. So I wrote it to, teleport around the world in sequence, because the rooms would go in a sequence number, even if they're not logically connected in a sequence, and it would create all of the rooms together. And so I mapped the entire game programmatically. Now, why that was easy. The part that wasn't easy is when it would map them, it would actually just map them in a straight line. Yeah, yeah. Because it didn't know the position of the rooms to other rooms. So I had to manually hand place each and every one of those. Get out. No. Yeah, yeah, that took forever. Uh, but it let me, this was one of those goals I had as a kid. I want to see this world. I want to <laughs> see this game. And this gave me the capability to do that. So it's a big game. You can see it for reference. This is the elemental planes on the bottom here, which we're pulling from the game and redoing them. But that's for reference, the, the elemental planes. They, they look small. They're infinite. So when you exit out the bottom, you end up on the top. So when you're actually on the planes, they feel like they're very vast and they're confusing. Uh, clever design. And then the rest of the game. This isn't all of the whole world, but it's a lot of it. 
And then lastly on the MUD clients, this is the current era of MUD clients. This is MUDlet. This one is currently in support and actively developed. It's open source. This is actually our client that we're releasing with the agent discovery that's actively in development as well that we provide players. So you don't actually have to do all of the fancy coding stuff to have a decent experience. If you don't want, we're gonna provide you some stuff out of the box that you can then layer on top or augment or even contribute to because it's gonna be open source. So that's pretty cool. All right. Muddy Lessons Part 2, Learning C. College class in 2002. You can notice that text is pretty small because I don't remember too much about it. When I was in that class, the t I remember the teacher, one, he was a functional alcoholic. I think uh, two or three semesters after I left there, he was let go for, you know, booze. But he was functional. He was a good teacher. The other thing, I slept every frickin' day in <coughs> class because he kept that room so cold. I passed out every day. Uh, most notable thing I did in there was like I made a tic-tac-toe game. Then in 2020, uh, I did so, some assistance. You know, I got a copy of a skill inside the game for the skill bash where I can knock someone onto the ground. And so I helped revise that skill. You know, so I could see a tiny sliver of what was in the game for a skill and just helped with that one which then by the time I got access to the code, the next biggest thing I did to help me figure out what C is like is compiling this thing on my own. Now this game runs in a BSD world. And uh, I don't want to mention the lifespan of that server and some type of lifespan that's used with software in terms of reference from a security side. Uh, runs on that server, a BSD server, and we wanted to bring it onto a more modern platform. So instead of even trying to get it run on some type of BSD and loading up some old BSD kernel, I was like, let me get this thing running on modern Linux. And so I did. So I learned a bit through that. And then I got into, I made this branch called Dev Cal Scratch, and I just had fun. I was just like, whatever I can do, whatever I want to do, I'm just going to do it. And eventually that ended up being enough decent ideas strung together that it became renamed as a different branch for the age of discovery that we're all going to be launching in April of next year. So really excited about this. Didn't really give this footnote, but that you know, 14 year old kid up at the beginning, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a game developer. That was one of the things that I probably would have said when I was like 14, 15. And it's true. I always wanted to be a game developer. It's fun. And it is fun. Uh, there's some headaches to it, but I enjoy it. So before ChatGPT, I, I, I kind of call this out, Learning C. So again, 2020 is when I started this. ChatGPT came out, what, November of? 22. 22. Yep. So that's a good two years, roughly, of me just fighting my way through C. So all I remembered from my C class was memory management is manual. That was it. That's all I really remembered. So I applied a lot of foundational skills I've gained over my career from bash scripting, PowerShell, and Python. Of those, PowerShell is probably number one. Uh, and I started out just modifying existing code. Like, I wasn't writing anything new. I was just kind of tweaking the stuff that was already there. Before I knew it, when I would create a new code function, I would scour the code to find something that was doing something similar to what it is I wanted to do and replicating it and just changing little bits of it to make my new code. And then where, where I needed to, I would look up like standard functions that could be from the standard libraries. I would just Google those definitions and read the doc about that one just to learn a little bit about what it is I'm reading. So these code bases, for example, one, 30 years old, or at the time of this, say 27 years old, 28 years old, multiple different pans are in this pot and the level of documentation is scarce to none uh, for a lot of stuff. You might have a little descriptor up at the top that gives you a summary about you know, what goes in, what goes out, and the last time it was ever touched. And of course, some Google in there, Google foo. Uh, I, I did, this was another AI image that I put together, and I had asked it to, to not make the steps add up linear. Like every step you take doesn't add a plus one. You know, so some steps you take actually take you kind of, even though you're going upwards, they might uh, additively be less than what it was. I actually wanted the steps to be different sizes uh, just to represent 
in uh, what it's like learning a language like this because you make small strides and you get small wins, but then sometimes something will click and you're like, aha, this makes a lot more sense. Learning C after chat GPT. This is where it gets fun. So what I've done here is I just go through my use cases for using AI in doing code development. And I think this would probably be the most of use for anyone that's interested in doing code development or is using it on any project. But you could apply these concepts in pretty much any type of project that you're using AI. I just want to kind of call that out. But for one, I use it to annotate and describe C code. So here I will give it, you know, I'll say, hey, I want you to annotate and describe the following code. And I'll give it the code. And this is just an excerpt from it. You can look at this and be like, what the heck is going on here? Switch or K0, Duke 2, FD0, file known, standard in. You know, so it does a pretty dang good job of stepping through these things and bit by bit will give you good annotations of what's going on. Now, you need to be at a skill level where you can call if the AI gets delusional, but in my findings, in my use, it's rarely delusional about things related to code it gets delusional when you start asking about things about our world, reality, opinions, and things like that. So next, I would ask it details about functions from standard lib or standard, you know, from those standard libraries. So instead of Googling and looking them up directly, I would simply ask direct questions of what it is I was looking for out of that standard library function. So I would say, hey, what are the successful return codes for the system call from standard lib. And it would do exactly that. It would tell me the descriptors, it would tell me where it would come from, and it would go through and give me the actual return codes and what they meant. Now, due diligence, if, I, if this didn't give me what I would need, I should definitely read the actual manual. You know, So I'm trusting AI a little bit here on this. It could totally steer me wrong, but so far it hasn't. This is my favorite. Um, use case because I hate writing those help file descriptors. <laughs> so I can ask it to say, hey, create a help file for the following code and create that help file in this type of format. So make sure you give it that guidance of what you want the output to look like and it's going to crank it out for you. So guess what? That's like me handing this off to uh, an intern yes. saying, do this work I don't want to do for me. And it just does it. And the worst thing I have to do is copy paste and do a little bit of cleanup. It's great. Uh, so before we do go open source with our black mud code, it's going to at least get this level of job done. Create new code examples. Uh, so this one's always fun where I can say, you know, here, create two examples in C that take the string input example, one comma three, and from this input return an integer array where, splitting the, where the splitting character is the comma. So notice I said I want two examples. So I, I'm basically looking for ideas at this point. It's like, I want to see some more than one approach for tackling this problem. And I mean, this is the advent code challenge that I'm hearing. Like, I'm describing a scenario to you, and it's like, sure, it's happy to help. You know, exclamation point. I love the enthusiasm from the AI. Um, so it goes into it, and then I reviewed the output, and I say, you know, that's OK. It wrote it right into main. I was like, I would really like to see your examples in their own functions. So don't be afraid to interact with the AI and be like, correct its work on how it did what it did. To be like, what you did there is okay, but I don't like this element about it. And I would talk just like that, you know, that's okay. I'm not saying what you did was crap or trash or anything. I, sometimes if I'm feeling froggy, I'll talk smack to it. But usually I'm, I'm just, you know, middle of the road, like, eh, you didn't do a good job. But it will do a good job if you correct it, uh, if you tell it the direction that you want to go. I use it to propose code <coughs> updates. So here's one where I have a function already, so I'm giving it this function, and I'm going to describe to it the update that I want to make to it. So you know, I'll call out specific aspects that are inside the code and tell it what it is I want. And for added context, I'll usually give it some examples of what would be inside that string, just so it gets some examples. That it's going to use it of what's the typical length of that string. So it would do a little bit better job on if it updates parameters, like say a, a character array, it'll probably do the sizing a little bit better than just say max string size. A little bit scarier when you do that though. You want to be able to review that code that it's doing and just thoroughly test it. 
And then lastly, non-code related tasks. That doing it? Yeah, so this is more like I'm working on the game documentation or lore or any type of different setup. But here, I'm, the latest thing I was working on was the lighting system in Black Mud, uh, where the world's gonna have more than just two modes of light of on and off. It's actually gonna have gradients of light. But like day, day or night? So that would be zero and one, that'd be the binary. Uh, the latest update is there's a range from negative 25, which is uber dark, or ultra, ultra dark, ultra dark, um, all the way up to blinding light. So a zero is, is just dark, but what if I cast a magical spell darkness? Well, it might get darker than just dark, which means creatures that have dark vision might not be able to see once it's darker than just regular dark. None more dark. Normal dark, 100 dark, extra dark. Uh, and then likewise, on the light scale, there will now be dim light. So a creature like an elf or a dwarf that has low light vision will be able to see you know, by a candlelight or when the sun's starting to come up or maybe when there's a, you know, a moon that's shedding some light down and it's a, a clear sky. These are all things now that are gonna allow that character to see. So instead of just seeing, you see darkness, which is what the game will tell you, you'll now actually be able to see in the dim light. But then likewise. Tonight is, there's an aurora out tonight too. So in the game, you know, with the. Aurora. You, you, know, uh, you know Northern Lights? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's happening tonight. Oh, nice. Probably not here. I, I don't know, he probably wants to do it here too. Anyway, sorry to interrupt. Oh, you're good. And then at the end of the scale is blinding light. So if it's blinding light and you happen to be a light sensitive creature like a vampire, that probably means you're gonna get an epic load of damage. Whereas before, if it was just light outside, you would just get daylight damage, whatever daylight damage is. Now we'll be able to scale that damage up. So players want to be vampires, they just don't know that they might not really want to be vampires if it's really bright out. So takeaways. Man, I've learned a lot through just this hobby. Uh, but my main takeaway, the reason I wanted to give this talk is, I've talked to a lot of folks over the years that are interested in programming and scripting. Uh, I've used scripting professionally a lot. Uh, and usually folks will see some of my work and then like to PowerShell or Python. A lot of people that can write those languages, they usually get asked, dude, how did you learn that? And how can I learn that? And there's always the, the class method and the course method. That's never been my path, that's never been my journey. So the recommendation I give folks is take a class, use the book as a reference to help teach you the basics, to learn your options in there. But if you really wanna learn something, I recommend you have a goal, have a task. If you have something that you're working towards, it's no longer a matter about the what it is you're working with. All these things that I stepped through related to this mud were nothing to do with those things. It's what I wanted to do with them. So I've rambled a whole lot just to give you that one takeaway that is for me, that is if you really wanna learn something, don't focus on the thing you wanna learn. Think about the thing it is you wanna do and use that thing you wanna learn to help get you there. That's my talk. Any questions? Russ. Can you go back uh, to the, I think it's two slides before this, maybe one slide. This one, yeah. Yep. So C code is, I, I don't know much about it, but I see that object, um, OBJ there. Yeah. Are objects in C? Uh, no, so. Yes. Yes, yeah, so this is a, a struct. Um, and so, and then there's pointers. So this is, and this is something I'm still learning as I just, this has been a thing that existed in the game. It's basically like an array that can grow as much as you might want it to. You don't need to manage it to that degree of its size. It has an element in it that allows you to point to the next one in the stack. So if you wanted to iterate over them, like an object, there's a point to it that says next that then just recursively will take you to the next one in the series. And then with the variable itself, then you can nest in properties. Uh, so object name is a literal, so that's a string there, but object flags is its own unique struct. 
the object then just references that, and then this has its own set of values there and properties in it, and that one is not an array, or it doesn't have a linking type value, that one's like a set instance, because it's uh, instantiated, I don't know if that's the right term, but it, it persists on every single reference of object. Like every, ob every OBJ would have a name property. Correct. And then every container would also have its OBJ name property, but it also might have volume property. Yes. Okay. Yep. So the, 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 the difference in, in C is you, your structs are data only. No methods. No methods. No methods. Okay. Yep. No functions, because C doesn't have methods. No yep. Fair. Fair. C itself is not an object-oriented programming language. Correct. But you can implement object-oriented programming language Techniques. methodologies in C. Okay. Yeah. Yep. And it's not when you say object, it's not what you think of as a. That's that literally an object in the object. game. Right. That's that's you're a using sword. Yeah. Braces. Anyway. Yeah. 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 It was a. Uh, one, of the, one of the first slides when you had the mapping of the rooms, mm -hmm. that, could you relate that, like, is it kind of like GIS? Because I never knew what, because, uh, you know, mapping, like satellite mapping of like Google Maps and things like that, could you apply that to those, anything, any images? Or how did, is it just like a two-dimensional uh, grid right now? Yeah, so there's an instance of it there, the mapper inside Mudlet, and then there is the, the See, I Zima. I want to learn more about this. I don't know what you did. Somehow I have to figure out how to do that. Yeah, I mean the work I did here was it works in games like ours if everything works is created logically together, but that's up to the builder. Like a, a creator of a, a, a zone, like of this zone, they could make these things. And you see it on some examples here, like you see that line right there, like when you exit left or west out of this room, it doesn't take you into this room, it takes you down into this room which is kind of jank. That's probably a mistake, not intentional. Uh, and then this one will take you, if you exit east out of it, it will put you into this room appropriately. So it's like, it's like um, when you, let's say like a whole building is closed. Someone taught me like, she could not, she tried to go to see where the exit is and she could not find the exit. It's kind of like, I want to learn more about that. Yeah, we, we've definitely made that easier because in this version, you know, if you're using something like Mudlet, there's a whole communication protocol called GMCP, Generic Mud Communication Protocol, we're now using. What's the RFC for that? Uh, it's an unofficial RFC. It never made it into, into the Telnet spec. Um, it uses sub-option 254 uh, of the Telnet protocol for its negotiation. Uh, and when that data is sent over, we pass through a room descriptor that will tell you the, the VNUM of the room you're in. And if you can see them, the VNUMs, virtual numbers, of the rooms around you. So it'll say like East VNUM and then the actual number. And then there's a different data object. You can see this map has doors on it. And check out, it's like right, this thing's not working. So that's a green door for an open door. And there the brown ones are for closed doors. So we actually pass over that GMCP data as well, the state of the door, and so then on the mapper, if it's in update mode, we'll update the door to show you, you know, is it open Do or is it closed? Do you have to see the door for it to update? Yes. Okay, so if somebody opens a door and you don't see it, your map still says closed. That's right. If I cast blindness on you, you're not going to be able to see the state of the door. Well, if you're in a different area of Oh, the map. totally. Most definitely you will not right. see it. Yeah, it will only update for you. If when you, you walk through to see them. Right. But if you happen to be in that space, and let's say the light level is dim, and you're a human, you're not going to be able to see the state of the door. It's going to be too dark for you. The variations of, of, of how bright things are, what you can see, based on your own... Perception. Ooh, that is... Yeah. That's the complexity. We have that. I, I've been impressed. Yeah, it's fun <laughs> stuff. Chaz, what you got? On the previous slide, you had a, a map in the top right. I'm just curious, was that generated or was that drawn? Or uh, That was when I mapped the world. That was my bot that did room by room okay. that I hand-placed. 
each, the layout. Each square? Each square. Okay. That's what I thought you were it saying. It took months. Like of the top rings. right. Of all of them, yes. Huh. Yeah. Any overlap where you realized there were two words? Verticality? On so top of each other that should not have been? You can see, like, right here, that big world. stretch out. It's because this is the city of Macalore that would not fit there. Like, otherwise, it would be smushed. So I had to stretch this stuff south and this stuff north. Okay. That's the same thing here. Like, that's not really a, a measure of distance. That's just so that this could fit here. Um, but for the most part, this was really impressive. That impressed the heck out of me. Like, over here on this side of the world, this is like, in the game, they're called areas. This is like six or seven different areas that mash together perfectly. And they were created at different points in time, sometimes even made by different people. And they, they fit outside of a very few exceptions. Those hard lines you see going through are normally what we call death traps. It's like you walk into this room and you slip and fall and go into a thing of spikes and you die. Uh, so that's them forcing you into a death room, basically. They didn't recreate multiple death rooms. They would use a little trick to just point you to <laughs> one death room. Because why not? You're dying. Pretty standard operating. Pretty standard operating procedure. Uh, the other thing I did was like right here. There's actually a little town inside there. I couldn't fit that in there. So you would see like there's just names. If you zoomed into it, it will say like Corzin, you know. And so that would be like a pop out like this. It's also kind of like let's say you've never been to the workplace that you wanted to go to, and you want to understand. You would use like not naive way of not being where the rooms are and you would make your own picture of what would you saw. Right? Yeah. Kind of like that. As a kid, I, uh, again, the, the reference back to the 14 year old picture, I used graph paper. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I, would, I would map the game with graph paper and I would use different colors to represent like, I remember, actually specifically, this is Bell Moran, so this section right here I did on graph paper and this is a, a wooded area with different types of trees, and I would use different shades of green for the different, like, oh, you're in a wood of elm, you're in a wood of, of oak. So I would visualize it, and I would see the trails and stuff like that. And it would help me understand the game world, because that was, for the longest time, the successful players, those that could put together groups, because you can play with other people, were the people that, would, that could traverse the world without any type of aid. And that's how you would play this game. Like a lot of times your directions and pathing, at least early on for me, would be like, unless you had the coordinates, like 23 east, five south, 17 west, five more south, down, down, open door, 20 west. You know, like unless you had the exact coordinates from a known location, it would usually be a lot of go all west until you run into the wall. <laughs> then go five south. Okay, you made it there. Go all west again until you run into another wall. You know, it would be kind of those types of navigations, and you would just memorize where the death traps were. And so you would pinpoint your location once you got near a death trap to make sure you didn't fall into a death trap because you would lose loot. Like in these games, like you can lose levels, you can lose gear, you can you get penalized. You can get you can get eaten by a top. You can die to a sparrow. And I didn't do that. What kind of the tiger is I don't know. They're pretty. The they're pretty tough. They can be. When you're level Hard one. Yeah. I forgot to swim in a river. Drowned in the river. No. No, I use the graph paper for every Sierra game oh, yeah. I played. Space Quest, King's Quest, mm -hmm. all of them. Only way to play. This is so new to me. It's cool. Step through time, man. Yeah, this is awesome. Yeah. What's crazy is MMORPGs, there have been dozens of them that have started and failed out. Yeah. And the fact that your mud is still going. Well, is pretty it's awesome. a lot. It's a lot different. But I don't cheaper think. to keep this running. Absolutely. Because oh, yeah. it's just a computer in somebody's corner or whatever, um, as opposed to um, massive amounts of content. Mass amounts of just compute that's needed to. Yeah. That's great. Cool. So on the, the chat GPT side of things, one thing I've been using in my tabletop Dungeons and Dragons game is I will, that many, I will say this is the, the monster, 
my characters are fighting. Uh, I would like a magical artifact that is evil or good or whatever. Can you generate that? And like one time I told it to create a, a book of like evil summoning rituals based off this monster, and it created like five pages of content. I read through it, made sure it was it was good enough, made it a PDF, and then handed it to my players when they, <laughs> when they found awesome. it. And they were like scanning through it, and like they found some clues and stuff that I was able to use. But uh, are you are you thinking about doing something similar with new objects and content and using ChatGPT to make more? Oh, totally. Um, I know at least one of our builders uses ChatGPT a little bit to help them with room descriptions, but when we, the elemental planes that you saw that, so we pulled those out. Uh, I did a, a pitch idea for the rework of that, probably in 2019 or 2020, to kind of a new vision for what the elemental planes for Black Mud could be. So I plan to take on that project, probably like after we get the Age of Discovery up and running and things smooth, I'm gonna work on Druids and we were pulling them from the game to rework them, and then we're going to also freshly relaunch the Elemental Plane. So I'm going to be re I'm going to go into the creative mode of creating content, and I fully intend to use ChatGPT in that way. I do use it in Dungeons and Dragons myself. Uh, I play a bard, so I'll use it to create some of the the plays or the stuff that my character will do. But I also use it to create his backstory. And the big, I don't ever feel bad about it because I define key aspects I would want in my story and then I will, just like you kind of saw, I will coach it and tell it the things I don't like and the things I do like. Another common trick of mine, uh, and it's right on this one actually, I don't just ask it for one output. Right. Whatever I'm asking it for, I say give me two or three of whatever it is I'm making. These photos, I generally would ask for in twos. So that way I'm, I'm not just taking whatever one photo it threw at me based off of the descriptor. Because I can give it the one descriptor for one of these cool photos, which I say they're cool. I, I love. Let's see. That do, one, you, do you pay for the chat GPT? I do pay for the chat GPT. Yep. The waiting list. Oh, is, you have, waiting is it a waiting list? list? Yeah, so I ended up going They're paying the process and can't handle all the. I went to the playground. Play instead and pay for just like direct credits. Okay. So you can you can get around it to get chat GPT four, but if you still want three point five or if you want three point five it's free. You don't yeah. need the wait. If you want four, you don't want the waiting list. Does doesn't that limit the number of of queries that you can put in? I've never exhausted it. Yeah. But the the free one? No, uh, the even the, the pay free. one you're limited on chat GPT-4 and it's unlimited on 3.5. Uh, I don't know if there's, they just recently added Dolly because they never had Dolly in there before and I, it, you had to like pay for that separate and then I saw I had Dolly, I was like, let me get some pictures going. Yeah, you, you can add like, uh, so if you go to playground.openai.com, it is. you can like fund an account, like I put $10 in there and I put it at the start of this month, I've used it pretty heavily so far. And I spent like 30 cents okay. um, using chat GPT-4 and creating some images. So mm -hmm. And if you use Bing yeah. chat to do that, you'll hit a limit fairly quickly on your revisions. I honestly, I haven't looked into it past just going to chatgpt.org and it gives me 10 um, per day. Uh, oh, I I I are you signed in with an account? No. Mm -hmm. uh. I was I just mean, saying, but I, I mean, I, I've never even hit ten per day, so I, I'm not worried. You know, I've, I've never needed to get past that. But I don't even know if I'm using Chat GPT three or four or right. one. Or I've never used it yeah. Well, even in the account one, it still has the option to upgrade. But like you're saying, yeah, like the very quick waitlist right. Wait right now. Yeah. Waitlist. Yeah, I saw that they were back when they were like, oh, we're only going to sell so many. I was like, I'm in. It's yeah, I like your your takes on like, the end when you told us because I uh, you know I've been in the same old the traditional work where they don't like to do something you find out what you want to do and then learn based on that not just doing like someone giving you tasks every day for like ten years it's just something different and then also um, I like that you give give two or three options for um, what you want like ChatGPT may give you one option or one mm -hmm. answer. I've got to learn more about that. The only other 
footnote I meant to mention on delusion, the area I most frequently encounter it, I did want to mention that. I, I specifically said the code stuff wouldn't give you delusion a whole lot, but on the non-code related tasks, so even on this light level example, I did the next layer down where I did weathers, and it went delusional when I started doing the weather ones, so. Did you uh, go to the DEF CON talk about uh, AI and chat GPT? I was, I was mudding. Watch, watch it. Okay. Um, it's really interesting because it actually explained, gave me a much better understanding of what it's doing, right? It is not optimized for truth, it's not optimized for information, it is optimized to be conversation. Yeah, mm -hmm. you're right. And it is nothing more than auto -complete. Yep. Yeah, I don't um, like ChatGPT that yeah, much. Yeah, fact check it all the time. Yeah. Well, I mean, you shouldn't even be really be using it for facts. Yes. Right. Right? If you want it to, re to put the facts you collected together into, you know, give it, hey, write a story with these components, it's great. But if you're like, hey, how does the sun rise? It, it, it has no real idea. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah it's, just, it's a really you interesting, you know, and, and the more you know how to use a tool, the more you know how the tool works, mm -hmm. the much better you are at yeah. using that tool for your yeah. And definitely fact check because it can get subnetting wrong. You can get, oh, yeah. You can ask it to write your Because it doesn't know how to, it doesn't know how to subnet. It knows what subnetting should look like. Right. <laughs> I will code say, is easy because it can actually reference and, re and it can actually it, it compile to an extent mm -hmm. the code that still may not actually do what you're asking it to. Where I've seen it hallucinate and freak out on code is where either it's the bad, I don't know whether it's trained or the bad response is coming out of like uh, some of the answer communities that are out there. Oh, I, there's some bad. It seems to be trying to blend together different responses on how to do some of the code. I really like your suggestions though. I wonder if it learned from Stack Exchange that that could be a bad problem. Probably to a degree. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure. sure. I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully not Microsoft support. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Uh, <laughs> I will say using any AI, but ChatGPT is an example. It's a skill. Yeah. The more you use it, the more you learn to use it. It's a tool. Um, it's a very useful tool. So it's one I recommend that you explore it. Yeah. <coughs> uh, I use it to, to write all my uh, uh, announcement emails. Mm -hmm. yep. <laughs> That's how I generally, yeah. from a work setting standpoint, yeah. I use it on the social interaction aspect more than anything for things exactly like that, yeah. emails. Hey, yeah, uh, had, uh, the, you know, Women Who Code Green Rules, that group, okay. uh, they had a little project for Hacked Over, and she created uh, two stories, like fiction stories, and she used ChatGPT. I did not like ChatGPT that much, so I just created my own version. My own story, sure. my own creation. I like that better. It, it depends on what you like, because if you want, if you have a missing blank that you want someone to complete, mm -hmm. instead of Googling, you can just put chat GPT or something. It's kind of like a story thing. It's crazy fast. Yeah. yeah. You don't want you. it to, <laughs> you don't want it to be the replacement for creativity. Right. Yeah. Sure. Is the big thing. So use it as something to enable your creativity. Like, it's accelerated my ability to be effective in what I'm doing and what my goals are because I can now use it almost like a coach or a teacher, but mostly in the way of give me very specific examples of what I'm looking for. Yeah. And it's, I, I, I'm becoming a, a grumpy old man because I don't like the version of the internet that we have today. That's a wholly different talk, but I'm, I'm really frustrated yeah. with the internet we have today. The whole internet, right? Yeah, the whole yeah. internet. I'm getting, I'm getting in one talk, tell us your ideas of what you would want. True, oh, man, I just want to go I back in time. That would be easy. AOL. Let's do IRC. it. I mean, this is new one. But it's it's getting much harder to find useful information That's online, yeah. even if it's technical information. It's getting much more challenging to navigate to find unless you're working off of like published documentation. Like I'm doing PowerShell and I'm going to Microsoft Source. That's a one for one. But if I'm researching a topic, like I'd hate to be a Linux admin now. Like, cause I, a lot of that stuff I would get from Linux forums to help me troubleshoot stuff. And now if I needed to do that, oh my God, that so was crap. There's so much crap. So much. There's oceans and oceans of crap. So 
from. And it's only getting worse when she's like generating their content for LinkedIn and everything else out of ChatGPT. Right. There's so much article reposting, and so if you have one crap article and then it gets reposted and propagated, then yeah, it's over. It's over. So I'm becoming jaded. That's a different talk. That's a talk for December of next year. There we go. <laughs> you want to get a little demo of the mud? Yeah. Sure. Um, That's a great question. That is a great question. Oh, let's make sure it's not crashed. Um, I should have shot video of you doing it at uh, DC 31. <laughs> of Mudden? On the, on the old terminals. On the old school? Oh, uh, that, that was, where it's at. that was, yeah. that was uh, interesting. Did you, did you go in and spend the first, like, 20 minutes scripting? No, I didn't do you any didn't scripting. scripting. Really? Yep. Yeah. So what is this interface, or you? What, what does it say you're on right now to actually run the game? Let's see. All right. Isn't so that mud, that's Mudlet. You just you I just Mudlet. yeah I launched up Mudlet. Mudlet. Yep. So I'll, I'll go ahead and, and rewind that a little bit. So here's Connect. So by default, when you download Mudlet and run it, you know, just ignore the black and this text and everything. We're just looking at this text box. It comes pre-populated with some MUD options. So you can see some icons here. Once we do this release in April, we're gonna be one of those MUDs that comes pre-kitted with MUDlet. So that's gonna be great for us from an accessibility perspective because otherwise you have to add a tile. Like you have to manually set up the server you wanna to connect to over here. Tell them that. Um, okay, so these, these are different these Close. are different games right here. So this is like right there. It's hard to see that, but that's Bat Mud. Uh, here's um, Listeria. Here's Empyrean. So each one of these is its own mud. If I double click this, I'm playing a completely different game created by totally different people, very likely. Now some of these, the, the pay to play ones, there's uh, IRE, I forget what that stands for at the moment, but they, they're, they actually do pay to play muds. Uh, and they're pretty successful, but they're about the only shop in the world that has a good pay-to-play model. Um, wow. And I think they have three different mud worlds that they run. Um, could totally be off on that. But that's what that is. So a bunch of different muds that come out of the gate. Uh, in April, <coughs> we're gonna be one of those muds out of the gate, so that's gonna help us draw in some players. Uh, but what I just connected to was the black mud uh, test server that I run for the game. So if I type L, that's short for look. I could also type look. You can see my prompt down here at the bottom. So that's what that's representing. So if I look and L are the same, there's a little interpreter inside the, the engine. So it's basically looking for an abbreviation of look. So L would be the shortest abbreviation of look that we prioritize because it's one of the most common commands you would run in the game. And that lets me see inside the room. So you can see that like each time I look, I'm seeing the same thing, but if there was a character that can sneak, as in, you know, like a rogue that can sneak into a room. So if a rogue sneaks into this room, I may not see them enter the room. So me looking again is my opportunity to see if they're actually in the room. So like if I force this uh, Bayless, oh, there it is, a straight cat meanders in from the south. So there was a cat in the, the room south of me. You can see here there's exits. So in the south of me, there was a cat. Now that cat just meandered <laughs> north. So if I look north, I see a stray cat in that room. You know, so if I then load up, load object, uh, short bow, load object, arrow. Oh no, eat arrow. Mr. Whiskers. Eat arrow. <laughs> Why did you just eat? So as an immortal, uh, an immortal can, can consume things to get rid of them. Um, a normal player cannot. <laughs> no actual cats are going to be harmed in the making of this, this film. So we'll go. Here, I'm not going to, I'm not going to shoot any cats. You saw where I was going with it. So now I'm going to wield the bow. I'm wielding that short bow two-handed. So I'm doing quite a few commands here, but now if I type equipment, this is what I'm using. I can see wield it two-handed, a short bow. 
Now this might not actually work because I'm working on objects right now and I'm trying to use objects to do something pretty specific. So if this actually works, I'm gonna be like, Eric, good job. Uh, so I look west, shoot, arrow, I don't even remember how to shoot, so help, shoot. Here we go. Shoot, arrow, west, fellas. So this is a thing inside the game I just showed, a help command. So remember I mentioned fuzzing. If you don't want to just be fuzzing, you can use the help menu, but who uses manuals and help fuzzing? Read man page. Right. Uh, so I just crashed the server. <laughs> well. Yeah, so this is where I would then fire up. Um, <laughs> but it's just your test, sir. This is, yeah, this is just my test. Server. Immediately. Oh, yeah, I know that immediately. That's, that's, I, I run the server in a debug mode using GDB. So right now, it's actually in a hung state that I would want it in that hung state because as a developer, now I can look at what caused me to hit this error, and I can debug and address it now. Well, is your server name Bellas? Did you just shoot the arrow at West Bellas? I take down your GDB session. It's not going to take down the GDB <laughs> session. The GDB session's not to the West. If it was, you know, shoot arrow West GDB. What, what is Wellis? The Vellas was this uh, oh, soldier that stands in the side of this room. So I was oh. targeting him okay. as he was standing to the room to the West of me. Now, assuming that this hit would have connected he would get very angry and he would charge into this room and he would attack me. So, yeah, but you're a god. I'm a god. So every one of his attacks would miss. Um, this is Blackbutt. Now, to kind of show a different thing, I talked about the, the lighting system. So this is new. Uh, so right here, this is a part of the Immortal site. And what you're looking at here is the L is representation of the lights that I'm holding as a character. So if I'm holding, uh, there's dim lights, so like elves could use a dim light. So if it's a dim light, it's going to give you a light level of one. If it's a normal light, it's going to give you a light level of four. So if for some reason you had either four different characters or one character was somehow decked out with four dim lights, it would cast enough light that it would be regular light. You know, it's like the features of, you have enough uh, you know, headlamps, you'll be able to see enough to call it seeing. The next one is the global light. So right now the global light level was three. And the current time, the hour, is this right here, T27. So there's 36 hours in the day. In the game, it's actually a minute. So there's 36 minutes is one in-game day. So at hour 27, the light level was three. So the sun is very likely on its way down. And at three, it's dim light, which means the only people who would be able to see right now are people that have low light vision. Otherwise, it would be dark. And then the S there is season, so it is spring, which dictates, you know, when's the sun up and down, it's gonna change based on the season that it is. So as the game plays out, you know, even the light level is from the sun and the moon will change based on the season that it is in the game. For people that create, like you create the mud games, for what kind, like what do most people that are users get out of them? Like is it more for like, uh, which crowd is it more? And what so that's a great question. There's a couple different types of players. There's even classifications that we, get, we give the, the players. <laughs> uh, the, the one that I most aligned with, I would say, is a power mutter. So a power mutter is someone who plays the game who's all about minning, minning and maxing. So I'm all about the stats. I'm all about doing the most amount of damage. I want to kill the biggest baddies in the game all by myself, wherever I can. So that's the mindset of a power mutter. It keeps someone occupied in a two-dimensional game. Yeah. So that's very object-oriented in the sense, objective-oriented, like I want to get this piece of loot. I want to get my character to be the best. The second type is the role player. And I enjoyed role playing too, but that wasn't what grinded my gears um, or drove my gears. But, but role players in these games, it's very open world. You know, like I could have, if I wanted, shot that arrow at that cat. Nothing would stop me from doing it. I could also, you know, emote and pick up the cat and pet the cat. Like there's a whole, a whole lot you can do in this different game, perspective. different perspective. There's no limitation. I mean, 
you could, once you kill your foe, you can behead your foe. Then you can have their head. And then what are you going to do with their head? Well, you can go and give it to the baker. You know, so there's this open element to these games where you want to go kill the king of this one city? You can go kill that king of that city. And some, uh, that draws a lot of people in because the feedback I've heard from players on what they enjoy about MUDs is when they play something like an MMO, a massive multiplayer online game, there's boundaries on them. Yeah. There's things that you can do and there's things you can't do. Yeah, see, people have tried, because, you know, the, we had, at our old company, uh, Super Duper, they had fun decks. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they had some people they wanted to, they thought that was a better way to teach them how to express things like this in different perspectives. So, like, things like abuse and things like that, and create a huge fun deck of that. So this is probably one approach to some people that want uh, to vent out what they're doing. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you all have noticed when the, the game was actually up and running, but this map updated automatically. Like, I was sitting at that place with that fountain. That's Market Square. And so I went one east because I was going to shoot an arrow at the guy over to the west. So that it automatically updated my position and said, hey, you're over here. There's an icon there. It's not displaying on this TV very well, but it shows a little fountain, so we get little icons with, for meaningful stuff. But that was just a good representation of, of that working in real time. All of this stuff would work you know, in real time based on that back-end data channel. The game wasn't crashed right now. If this is your first time like getting into the game, do you have that map layout as well, or do you, do you have to venture out to kind of? So we provide the map okay. at the start, but it's just uh, the starting cities. We're still working on answering that question of how much we want to give the players. Because we don't want to, like if you saw the whole world map and we gave that to you up front, some of the players enjoy exploring the world and yeah. mapping the world. So we don't want to take that joy away from people. So we're, we're actively talking through conver conversing as admins of the game saying, what do we want to do here? We know we definitely want to give like the city maps for where you can start in the game. Because if you're new to this game, like, oh my god, it's tough. It's really tough. It's hard on them streets. Killed by a tiger. <laughs> or sparrow. Or maybe the cat. Or maybe the cat. Or maybe yeah, yeah, the yeah. cat. Then, I, then I drowned in the river right after that. They'll attack you when you're sleeping, too. I don't know if you know that. Like, so you're using a client, but if I use Telnet, I can still use Telnet, and, but there won't be a, uh, a map. It's just, right. the text. It's just going to be Telnet. Yeah. And it's up to you. intended it. Right? It's up to you to enable you know, ANSI color. It's up to you to to enable like if you're the client can support end of record. Like we're using Telnet EOR per the spec, per the actual RFC <laughs> of EOR. Now that wasn't in the, the game that's running actually that one is live today, but as of like twenty twenty, we never support end of record. So when the game server was done sending data to you, the client we just left it hanging. Like we never told you definitively we were done sending you data. So the clients would still catch that within like half a second or less, but it wasn't as snappy. So when we implement an end of record, like your players were like, man, this is it's faster. How'd you make the game faster? <laughs> the other thing would be if you slammed enter, like just held down the enter key. I wish the game was still up. I could connect up to a different one. Um, but it would eventually just start spamming your prompt. That's what this is called, your prompt. It would just start spamming your prompt because the server would be sending you your prompts and you would never know the end of the data feed. So it would just think it's like, here's your prompts. Or I'll hook them, you know, and it's one big blob. Whereas now with end of record, if you slam and hold the enter key, prompt, 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 it's now linear. It goes down vertically um, because we definitively tell you we're done sending you data. So do whatever you need to do to show the data. So it's much cleaner, it's snappier. Yeah. There's a whole, a whole another talk on the data <laughs> pipeline behind this because we collect logs now. I was about to say I wanted, to, I wanted, I was looking forward to the the cripple log elk <laughs> stack <laughs> discussion. That's what I was. That's what I came to. Sorry, next year. Is it still on Oracle? Or has it been 
Yeah. No, nope, Oracle Linux. So I was migrating over to a different, actually, pay to play server because during the alpha, we encountered quite a bit of lag uh, because someone doesn't know how to write C. <laughs> um, but it's actually something I should have called out here on that, the, the modern lessons, but code review and working with people, partnership. Uh, there's another member of our team out of Canada who reviewed some of my, my code work and he gave me three or four different optimization recommendations and wouldn't you know, you know, I implemented like the first two and we're back running on the free tier, you know, with no lag, with the whole world opened up. You know, there's 100 plus zones, I opened them all up, so that's thousands of mobs, thousands of items, all you know, single, remember this is C, so it's just an engine that runs on a single thread and in, in, in a cyclical loop, Whoa. no lag. <laughs> Could you do anything with like airplanes or cars? In the mud? Have, have they ever done that? There are muds that. There's muds that do that. We have intentions of doing like uh, wagons. There's already mounts in the game, like you can ride a horse and that kind of stuff. Um, I had a support so you can ride like dogs or wolves or other stuff, <laughs> you know, like there's always the idea like if you're a halfling you want to like ride in on like a mastiff or something. Yeah. There's a cavalier class so you could be a halfling cavalier riding a mastiff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> why, why play a mud? There, there you go. Yeah. That's why you can play a mud. Um, but we have intentions of doing things to make it easier to get from like a, a city to another <coughs> city if you don't know how to do it yourself or maybe you want to start that process and walk away and make a coffee or something we want to put into the game like horse-drawn wagons or something like that or maybe even magic based stuff but you can hop into this thing pay the ferryman the cost and in the game it will do the navigation for you yeah. Yeah, but if you walk away you could still get attacked during the coach well that's the idea is it's going to be safer I mean yeah there, there's Probably a chance you could get uh, jumped, but much safer than you, like just rolling it yourself. Yeah. See, going from my brother, who plays like huge, like three dimensional games, like you know, the, uh, all those popular ones, this is kind of easier for me to grasp on how to start playing a game, much less coding it. Like, it's like. Uh, so it requires like, you to remember in your head what things look like, though. So it, it, it's easier for some people, but harder for others. I, yeah, I love the imagination aspect of it. Because even when I was playing the CR online games, they had that static image you were staring at. It forced you to think more critically about that world. Like, what am I missing? Why right. can't I move from this screen to the next? <laughs> That's what draws me to this. Speaking of that, uh, I've seen some ASCII art from ChatGPT. It's pretty nice. Has there been thoughts of adding like portraits for an exam in engineer Bellis and it generating a portrait based off of that? So we've talked about some stuff like that. Our next endeavor that we're gonna go into on refining the game from what's presented to you, we actually want to go the other direction and make it a more optimized for people that have visual impairments. So that way, like instead of adding in more ASCII art, which is gonna be much harder to interpret and present to someone that's using a screen reader. Yeah, yeah, we wanted to go the other direction and, and put some accessibility options in the game that entices, you know, if someone wants to play that has, you know, they're blind or they have vision impairments. Or they don't wanna see you. Yeah. They don't wanna see you when you it's good. It's a good idea. Cool. Yeah, which means you could then extend it further into maybe a mic to speech to text based responses on mm -hmm. the audio if you're hearing that. Hmm. Yeah. You seem to have lost most of your uh, your uh, people online. I ramble. Well, we've also been. They can't hear us, so they. So uh, we've been been. They can hear us. Wild, but. See, I don't think they can hear us. Oh. Yeah. yeah. So they, just, they just hear me. And depending on how close. He's mic'd. <laughs> I, I, they can probably hear me without the technology. <laughs> uh, 
I'm going to cut this for a second. Don't enter your password. That's, I'm not going to show you guys. <laughs> I would probably have wandered away by now, too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Let's hopefully I don't get taken over by Were you still sharing on uh There we go. So this is the production game. This one won't crash. Uh okay. When I <laughs> shoot something with a bow and arrow. Um I was about to say that sounds like a so it sounds like a challenge. Here's the game. So this is just cool to show. Like I did the who command, so this is showing who's connected to the game right now. Those that have the cyan type color to them, the dim cyan, those are immortals. So I'm Calitur, Cal, uh, the malevolent tree. My, my persona, I'm basically a, a nature-based god. Uh, I'm all about restoring the balance of nature by any and all means necessary. Mm, so I can be vengeful. Um, but then everyone else that you see, Gonovan, Reed, Cern, Moxart, Cope, Kristen, those are all players. Um, What's the red PK or the... Uh, so those are people that are flagged for player versus player combat. So if Cern so won it, he could attack Genovan and take him out. Uh, but otherwise, you know, if you're not flagged for PvP, then you can't really combat with anyone else. PvP used to be a thing in the game where once you got over level 15, it was game on. It was season on. Uh, you could just take someone out if so you, you wanted get to. to. You get to level 15 and then... Uh, level you could get green. Comes by and goes, thank, yeah. you. thank you. Thank yeah. you. Because you would drop some of your items. You drop a percentage of your gold. Um, so it's a part of my roadmap. I'm going to do arenas in each of the major cities to bring the spirit of PvP back. So there's going to be less penalties, more rewards, and there's going to be like ladder leaderboards or ladder boards where uh, like class versus class. So like thief versus thief. So who's the best thief versus thief in the Tanzer arena? You know, things like that. So there's going to be different types of um, rules in different arenas. Like if you're in an evil-based city, because there are evil cities, it will be to the death. And when you die, it will be the legit death penalties, because you decided to battle in the evil city arena where there's not a recovery ward, you know? Um, but there might I be. I have one where, like, you're already in the fire, to like let's say everyone's sitting in the fire and you don't want to create more fire right yeah uh, i don't know the fire arena mm. you could have one where there's arrows flying in at you or there's panthers or tigers, tigers. like just recreate <laughs> was it uh yeah. gladiator, gladiator. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so um yeah Yeah, I'm good. Okay. As soon as I go to wrap up, I get a new question. <laughs> but it's fun. I'm passionate about this stuff. So I can talk all night about MUDs. Um, but this shows you a little bit more of the game as it is right now. But you can notice, just because we're on the production game, there's none of that light level stuff here. And because you haven't implemented that yet, or because you don't see that? This is the production game. So all of the stuff I've developed on my... Is it, is it there? This, it'll go live in production April 1st, as long as it's not a joke. And do you have the beta going now? The beta was going to start this weekend. I pushed that out to okay. January. Hmm. Wasn't it supposed to go live in October? <laughs> this is a laser pointer, right? <laughs> <laughs> Halloween, if I... Yeah, I, I, I thought so. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Life, life, sorry. Yeah. It's something about you can't do f fixes on the alpha that was running at the time. Well, like you can't do fixes and code on the beta at the same time. So I was running the alpha, and then during that time, I had marked myself like, oh, I can work on the beta while the alpha's running. And then later on, well, no, the reality is, is when the alpha was running and they were finding problems, I was fixing the problems during the alpha, right? Sure. Uh, so I wasn't doing any beta work during the alpha, and then now I have to re-engage and go back into beta mode, so different branch, and remember what it is I was doing, because I had a full stop. You know, so there's 
sh gear shifting times. But you also have to income. You have to to merge the fixes Changes. from alpha back into the beta branch yep. so that they yeah. yeah. Good luck with that. Thanks. Oh, I'll do it. Okay. Oh, I know. Yeah. But it'll be fun. Yeah. Wait, is this just uh, grading? Like you're just showing what's happening in the room? Yeah. yeah. So like Mike settling in the world. So there's updates. You know the guard. One guardman came in and one guardman went out. Mox art gossips. Geez, sloppy, messy. It's probably talking about stuff lying around in the city. I agree with them. But yeah, there's mobs moving all around, doing all kinds of stuff. Um, you can create your own imaginary world on what like a story. Mm -hmm. There's even uh, player-run organizations in the game. So like we saw that Legionnaire Velas. So the Legionnaires is an actual, I think we're going to rename that because it ties into our world, but uh, that was a player-run organization. Actually, my old school character was a member of the Legionnaires where you would, like, if a player was killing mobs inside the city, NPCs in the city, like, I'm the law, so I can charge you for your crime, I can beat the snot out of you, then I can arrest you and I can throw you into a jail cell, basically put you in timeout. <laughs> as a player uh, the jail cell is kind of a forced timeout you can't run any commands you know you have to wait out your sentence oh, nice. Sleep. Yeah. <laughs> so. it's a wide world a wide wild world Very cool. that was awesome. excellent well done thank you Cal yeah, I think this is my only talk this year uh, maybe right all right, for those of you online, we're going to shut it down, and if you're going to meet us over at Double Dogs, we'll see you there. <laughs>